Howdy, with this video, uh, I want to uh, talk about the romantics in a little more detail, particularly one major idea that they're, they're wrestling with. Uh, it's very easy to read all the information from response number two and kind of go like, well, okay, they like symbols and inner worlds or whatever. Um, but uh, they're, they're wrestling with a, a very important idea that I want to talk about, and uh, it's also an idea that we're going to talk about with the rest of the fiction and the drama in the course. And to get to this idea, I want to use the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, a, a fascinating person, a very prolific writer. He thought he was going to die young, and in fact he did, unfortunately. Uh, but he's just pumping out information and, and wants to get to truth and, and knowledge and just as fast as possible. And uh, he's also trying to wrestle with a lot of these romantic ideas in terms of a Christian framework. Uh, and his challenge is he's kind of working in what's called the golden age of Denmark uh, in the early 18, early to mid 1800s. Uh, and he's looking around at the society and he's kind of, it's not matching his uh, ideal of Christianity. Uh, so like, well, the, the way it's been taught, handed down, the way it's being handed down and explained to me is it's not matching uh, what I'm thinking inside my head. And... Uh, one of the uh, challenges he's facing is how you know how how do you wrestle with that that idea, and he eventually uh, lands upon Socrates, uh, particularly in so uh, Plato's Apology, where Socrates talks about his inner daemon, uh, daemon D A E M O N, uh, this it, and what and Socrates uh, uh, talks about this as being kind of this inner voice uh, that warns him when he's about to do something wrong. Uh, which was a, a very radical idea for the Greeks. Uh, Greeks' truth and understanding and life was handed down through uh, tradition and you know what people have told you, basically. In fact, we still do that today, right? If you're a conservative, what are you conserving, right? But uh, you know, Socrates says, well, this inner voice tells me not to do certain things or tells me when, somebody, what's something, when somebody's telling me something that's not correct. Uh, it's not a proactive voice, but it, it kind of, it's kind of this... It's this inner truth that, uh, you know, when, he's put, when Socrates is eventually put to death uh, for not believing in, in what the state preaches, uh, he's kind of admitting that he does that in a way through this uh, idea in the apology. <coughs> uh, but Kierkegaard uh, kind of picks up on this idea and kind of runs with it and comes eventually uh, comes uh, to the conclusion that truth uh, is ultimately inner and subjective, which you kind of got with Emerson and Thoreau, right? You know, it's your idea right for me kind of question. Uh, but Kierkegaard says it's even it's even deeper than that. Uh, this is just how how truth works. It's inner, it's subjective, uh, and he doesn't reject external truth. It's you know, like, uh, objective external truth can be out here, but the individual has to look at it through their experiences and uh, their intellect and their emotions or whatever. Uh, and try and figure out uh, what, what we're looking at. Uh, if, if your cornhole didn't pucker a little bit with that idea, you didn't hear it quite right, <laughs> because it has profound implications about uh, what truth is, is and how we apprehend it uh, and you know, what, what the significance of it is once we think we've arrived at it. But to Kierkegaard, you have to, at the beginning of it, is admitting that this is going to be an internal subjective search. And it may be imperfect, but it's all we have. And that's uh, once you take that leap of faith, uh, you, it kind of frees you in a certain way, but it also produces angst and despair. And uh, like I said, he's just an interesting person, a very intense writer if you ever get a chance to read him. Uh, but one of his favorite stories to work with, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm still uh, battling sinus problems. Uh, it's the biblical story of Abraham and Isaac. Uh, and this is from Genesis 22, where God decides to test Abraham and tells him, hey, I want you to take your son and, and, and sacrifice him. I want you to go to this mountain, uh, go up there, you know, prepare the sacrifice. Uh, basically, he's going to stab him and set him on fire, right? Uh, and uh, Abraham uh, follows those directions. He takes him to the mountain. He has a couple of servants with him, but of course, he tells the servants to stay behind because if the servants saw him doing this, uh, they'd probably try to stop him, right? Uh, setting your kids on fire, <laughs> uh, stabbing them and setting them on fire was not a, a, a societal norm. Uh, never has been, really. But, uh, but, but Abraham gets all the way 
to the point where he's got the knife over him. He's ready to go, and uh, an angel comes and says, whoa, okay, stop. And Abraham passed the test because he's willing to sacrifice his son uh, because God tells him to. Uh, and what Kierkegaard kind of gets out of this is this idea that, you know, Abraham can't explain this to anybody. I uh, can't tell anybody what he's about to do once he, you know, God commands him to, to sacrifice his son. Uh, he doesn't ask anybody else about it. He doesn't go to his friends and say, yeah, well, does this sound right to you? Well, it's just he, believe, he, he has this in, internal understanding uh, that God wants him to do this, that he must do it. He must obey, right? Uh, but even as he's on his way, he tells the servants to stay behind because, and doesn't tell them what he's about to do because they hopefully try to stop him. Uh, they're just not going to sit by and watch uh, someone murder someone. Uh, and even after it's over, uh, there's no real explanation about what happens inside Abraham's head. Uh, what, how, how are you going to tell anybody, anybody else about this uh, profound uh, spiritual experience uh, where you almost sacrificed your son uh, because you, you, your, your understanding was that God wanted you to do that? Uh, it's a it's a fascinating story, and Kierkegaard kind of says this is, this is that's kind of how truth kind of works. It's it's this internal, subjective. You can't explain it to anybody. Uh, and part of, part of the problem is other people are examining truth through their own experiences and ideas. And you know, sometimes explaining it's just not possible. Uh, and you're going to kind of get that with the romantics. I see that a lot with uh, Hawthorne, where. Uh, characters arrive at these truths, but they can't explain them sometimes, and <laughs> may not always be a positive truth. And uh, same thing with post Poe characters sometimes. So, so, so kind of Emerson and Thoreau kind of represent a very optimistic view of, the, of this idea that uh, truth is internal and subjective. In fact, with Emerson, it's like this is awesome. I can just recreate myself over and over. I don't have to be consistent. Uh, I can just reinvent myself, uh, and it's legitimate to do that. You see, also see that with. Uh, uh, Walt Whitman, uh, you know, do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I'm large, I contain multitudes, uh, and this leaves the grass here, right? And, uh, and it's, it's a fascinating uh, way to look at the world, uh, but it's also scary because what if you're not a particularly good person and you're listening to these internal truths and they guide you in the wrong direction? Uh, so there's plenty of problems with ideas and plenty of uh, the Kierkegaard's contemporaries pointed them out. <laughs> Uh, but Kierkegaard kind of said, like, well, tough. <laughs> this is how truth works. And you either got to deal with that and move forward. Uh, and it takes courage to do that. Or you're just going to kind of take what people give you and accept that as truth. And uh, that's not quite what Kierkegaard wanted to do. Uh, so, again, I wanted to kind of stop. And this is kind of a very important idea. It's going to come back when we hit the existentialists. Uh, some people call Kierkegaard, the, you know, the original existentialist, because of some of these ideas, which we'll get into later. Uh, don't worry about that. But the, like I said, these romantics are, uh, they seem kind of flaky sometimes, but they're getting to, into something very, very important. Uh, and and it's and, and kind of getting to questions that we've got to deal with ourselves, right? And uh, that's a, kind of up to the individual about how to deal with those. Um, I did it in eight and a half minutes. But I'm going to stop it there, and we'll talk to you later. I'm interested to hear your responses to the the, the discussion, uh, the response paper prompts, uh, the, all, all the information I gave there, and plus this video. Um, and again, you don't have to agree with all this, right? But hopefully you're kind of starting to realize we're going to be asking some big questions in this class and examining how these authors work with these big questions. Uh, but how you answer those questions is, is up to you. It's not um, it's very Kierkegaardian of me to say that. But uh, we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.